The Holy Gospel according to Luke. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor. In case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host, and the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of the Lord. Hi friends, my name is Michael Price and I am the Bishop of the Eastern Synod. It's a privilege to be with you today, and I want to thank you for providing your pastor or deacon with some much-needed relief and time for rest and restoration. The ELCIC Summer Sermon Series is a wonderful opportunity for us to all support our rostered leaders and to experience the amazing breadth of our wonderful church from coast to coast to coast, and I'm delighted to be a part of this effort. In Paul's epistles, one of the themes that is worked over and over and over again is that of incorporation into the body of Christ. People who are isolated, separate, and alone are called into the life of a new community. The dead are called out from the isolation of whatever cave it is that has imprisoned them and called to stand and live within a reordered community whose disciples are called to live as a salt and light family of faith, whose relationships have been made right and made new by God's grace. Paul describes that reality in his letter to the Galatians by saying that for those who are clothed in Christ, there is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. It's a beautiful picture. But in life, we know that those distinctions do exist. We know that in the Church of Galatia, they most certainly existed. For why else would Paul have written this if there were not struggles related to the status of Jew, Greek, slave, free, male, and female? Those distinctions also exist within our church not literally Jew and Greek, but most certainly the in and the not so in. Perhaps not slave and free, but certainly those with power and those without power. And who would deny that there are distinctions between male and female, gay and straight, rich or poor, indigenous and non-indigenous, black, brown, and white? Those distinctions most certainly exist and testify to the measure to which we fall short of the standard of what Paul says it means to be clothed with Christ. Our seating plans are not aligned to those of the kingdom as it's described in today's gospel lesson. I'm glad that our church is starting to come to terms with that reality. At this summer's ELCIC National Convention, we received the reports and recommendations from three task forces 
whose creation was mandated by the 2019 ELCIC convention to address ableism, to address racism, white supremacy, and issues of racial injustice, and third, to address homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. Those reports and recommendations are available on the ELCIC website, and I commend them to you. Clearly, we have a lot of work to do, and it's work that I welcome, and I hope that you do too. And now a story. One night, 36 years ago, I was sitting in a chair at home. It was a comfortable chair, made especially comfortable because it was a Saturday night, my sermon was done for the next day, and the World Series was on television. All was well with my world. It was a great game. The sixth game of the 1986 World Series, Mets and Red Sox. We were moving into the eighth inning with the score close and runners on base. It was around 11 o'clock. And then the phone rang. I always jump when the phone rings after a certain hour at night. I'm always afraid that something terrible might have happened. Someone's died. Some crisis has occurred. And so I was a little nervous as I rose from my comfortable chair that Saturday night to answer the phone. I said, hello? And a very weak voice, muffled, asked simply and with no preliminaries, could you come and see us? We'd like to talk to a pastor. To be truthful, my internal voice was saying things like, don't you know that it's 1130 on a Saturday night and that my sermon is all done and that the World Series is on and that it's a close game in the eighth inning that I'm sitting in my comfortable chair and all is well with my world? You'll be gratified to know that instead my professional external voice asked, do you need to see me tonight? Are you sick? Do you need help? No, we just want to talk to a pastor. And so, reluctantly, I said I'd come. And I got up from my comfortable chair and shut off that World Series game that was so close in the eighth inning. I put on my coat and I left. And that's how I ended up meeting my two friends, Alvin and Milton, two bachelor brothers who became a very important part of my life over the next few years. They were quite a pair, long hair and Rip Van Winkle beards. Milton had a huge Raven's Wings mustache that completely covered his mouth. That's why it had been so difficult to understand him on the phone. The man was talking through a bird's nest. They lived in the bottom half of an old house a few miles out of town. The only light in that room that night was the flickering of a small black and white television in the corner. No sound, didn't work. And there were boxes everywhere of every size and description. Kentucky Fried Chicken boxes stacked all along one wall. And I remember there were at least a dozen of those red toolboxes you get at the hardware store scattered around the room. We talked for a long time that night. They told me portions of their stories about a long distant time growing up on a farm, of eventually being banished from that farm and being left penniless by a spiteful brother. They talked about all sorts of things. But what I remember most about that night, with shame and embarrassment, was how when I came into the house and Milton motioned for me to sit in the big overstuffed chair sitting in the corner of the room, I declined. It's okay, I said. And then I quickly pulled up one of those red Canadian tire toolboxes and sat on it instead. You see, the chair they directed me to was not my comfortable chair. This house was dirty. Alvin and Milton were dirty. It was obvious they hadn't changed their clothes in days. 
And it was also obvious to me that they slept in those same clothes and in those same chairs. And so when I looked for a place to sit, one of the steel toolboxes seemed to be the safest option available. It was bright and red, hard surfaced, made in a factory, sold in a store. It was the closest thing to my comfortable chair that there was in that room. I needed to insulate myself somehow, and to my shame, I could not on that first visit accept their invitation to sit with them. But lots of visits followed. Often I'd stop in the mornings on my way to visit in the area hospitals. They lived right on the highway and usually they'd be out in the driveway sitting in the now disabled 64 Chev that they had lived in the previous winter. They'd sit there for hours on end. I'd stop and we'd talk. Milton always sat in the driver's side and would usually have a coffee in one hand and a beer in the other. And on a particularly festive day, he might have one of those little two ounce bottles of rye tucked between his legs. And as we'd talk, he'd take little sips back and forth. Never saw him impaired in any way. I think the beer and the coffee would last him most of the day and he'd just be wetting his lips back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes we'd visit in the house and they talk about old times and eventually showed me the little treasures that were locked up in all those toolboxes. Old pill bottles, some old photos, faded restaurant placemats. One year on Alvin's birthday, my friend Fred Ludolph and I, another pastor who had befriended the two brothers, we surprised them and brought in a meal, Kentucky Fried Chicken, of course, and we had a little party together. The place was still filthy, but somehow as our relationships developed, the uncomfortable chair had somehow become more comfortable. Visits became more frequent. I looked forward to them. And in time, I actually learned to sit in the chair that I had once so brazenly and dismissively avoided. Eventually the story comes full circle. One beautiful spring day, about a year after Milton had died, Fred and I took Alvin and my daughters out fishing in celebration of his 78th birthday. It was the activity that he had chosen when Fred and I asked him what he would like to do to celebrate his birthday. He told us he hadn't fished in 50 years and we had a great time. We caught a lot of fish. And then we went back to my house and we cooked them up. We had a birthday cake, a glass of beer, balloons, homemade cards from the kids. And all of a sudden it struck me. Alvin was at my house and was sitting in my chair. The same comfortable, safe, secure, and easy chair that I had been so reluctantly pulled out of on a long ago Saturday evening in October during the sixth game of the World Series. In the gospel accounts of his life and ministry, Jesus describes the reign of God in the broadest and most inclusive of terms. He calls us to leave our comfortable chairs and to sit in the chair that makes us uncomfortable. To invite those we see as different to sit in the places that have previously been denied to them. I would encourage you to be open to both issuing and receiving those invitations. To risk the uncomfortable chair. To risk considering how we might move beyond the safety of our too comfortable definitions of who should sit where and when. Our often unexamined definitions of who is in and who is out. Change the seating plan. Welcome and accept Jesus' invitation to follow his call to whomever and wherever that call may take you. In doing so, you might well find unexpected and rich blessings. And as Jesus promises, a new and abundant life. Amen.